Chapter 44, Community Ecology. When we think about community ecology, we want to remember what communities are. And a community are lots of populations of different species that live in the same place at the same time. The difference between a community and an ecosystem, the ecosystem includes the physical environment as well as the communities that live there. Community ecology is simply the study of how the different species interact within the community. And ecosystem ecology studies the energy that flows between the different organisms in the ecosystem and the biomass. So sometimes we look at patterns in science often. And one of the things we look at with ecology is species richness and species diversity. The richness of a species is the number of species found in a community. So they vary within a community. They may have lots of a certain type of bird, but not many lizards. But in a neighboring community, there may be tons of lizards and hardly any birds, right? The number of species of most taxa is going to vary based on the geographic range that it's taking up. It will increase from the polar to the temperate. So it goes at the polar um, caps, you're going to have very, very little diversity and species richness. However, as you move away from the ice caps and move toward the equator or the tropical areas, you'll come toward the maximum where there will be a great number of species and a lot of each type. You will also see increases that vary by topographical area which is like when you're looking at a map, right? How is it mountainy? Is it flatland or different things like that? And then you also see a reduction in the number of species because of the peninsular effect, which is the distance that the main body of land and where the um, organisms are found are located. So if there's an island or a peninsula, you may have a different richness or diversity because it's farther from the mainland. If you look at the image to the right, you can see that the high mountain areas are going to have good richness. Arctic areas very low. The peninsulas will be lower than closer to the mainland. And as you move toward the equator, you'll get richer and richer um, in your species number and the diversity. So one of the things we look at with ecology is how things vary north to south and east to west, right? So we, one of the terms we use when looking at the globe are latitude and longitude. And latitude is the flat, right? The flat lines. Longitude are the lines that are long. The flat lines are parallel to the equator. The longitudinal lines go from the pole to the pole. So when we look at the latitudinal gradient, we're looking at how species change as it moves away from the equator or toward the equator. When we look at how communities diverge, we can see that over time, the number and diversity increases. Temperate regions have less rich communities than tropical ones. It is believed that this is because they are younger and have only more recently recovered from being uh, part of the glacier, right? Some support for that is we would see unglaciated lakes and there will be a lot more worms than in glaciated lakes. So further into the tropical jungles, you'll see more worms and things and less in the Arctic tundras. The drawback, it's limited because it's applicable only to marine organisms. Another hypothesis for the latitudinal gradient 
larger areas have more species because they can support larger populations. Now this just makes sense. And if you look at the diagram, you can see that the bigger the area, the more species of insects are hosted on the different various types of trees. There is a significant relationship between the number of host trees and the insect diversity. But the problem is there are not more species in Asia than there are anywhere else. And Asia has the largest, actually the tundra is the largest, but it has the lowest richness. The open ocean has the largest volume, but it has fewer species than tropical surface waters. So there are instances where this does come into play and then instances where it does not as well. Another hypothesis for a latitudinal gradient is species productivity. So this is trying to say that there are high richness in the hot moist areas and very low richness in the arid southwest desert regions. So there's a greater production of plants and greater overall species richness. And this can be represented by the rate of evapotranspiration. The support for this is that plants grow better where it's wet and warm. And this makes sense, right? We had to have special um, adaptations for plants to be able to live in the deserts. So the problems we see, though, are some tropical seas have very, very low productivity, but high richness. Also, the sub-Antarctic Ocean has very high productivity, but low species richness. So the productivity does not always lead to greater species diversity. The way we calculate species diversity is we think about the relative abundance. This would be like the distribution. And so we would say, at what frequency does the species occur in the community? So if we're looking at two species, we see that there are 99 um, individuals in species one found in community A and one individual of species two in community A. Both communities are showing us that they have diversity. They both have two of the species, right? Two different species. The richness is equal between them because there are two species. But if we look at community B and it has 50 individuals of species one and 50 individuals of species two, they're more evenly distributed. And so the relative abundance is higher in community B. Why is this? It has a bigger diversity because we have a better chance of running into both species one and species two in community B than we do in community A. So one of the things that we try to um, use to measure the diversity of species then is the Shannon diversity index. And we want to see how diverse a community is, because sometimes the number of species present doesn't indicate exactly the diversity. So the higher the value on the Shannon diversity index, the greater the diversity. We see that HS, the diversity index, is the summation of the proportion of individuals in species I times the natural log of proportion of individuals in species I. However, because of the natural log always being negative, we have to take the negative summation. So if you notice, after the equal sign is a negative sign, and that way we always have a positive index. So if we look at a hypothetical community, we have five species and 100 total individuals in the population. Okay, so species one, the abundance is 50. So for species one, the P sub i is 0.5 or 50 out of 100. If you take the natural log of P sub i, you get negative 0.693. If we multiply 0.5, the pi, times the natural log of pi, the negative 0.693, we get negative 0.347. We take the inverse summation, so now we have a positive, so it would be 0.347. That's one species out of the five. 
The value for real communities in the Shannon Index will range between 1.5 and 3.5. The higher the value, the greater the diversity. So if we look at all of these total, we see that the species diversity, when we add them together, gives us a negative 1.2. And our negative summation makes it 1.2. So this species community is very tiny because it was make-believe and there were only 100 individuals, which is why it's a little shy of that 1.5 marker. But in reality, out in the wild, you would see them fall between 1.5 and 3.5. So one of the things that we look at with species diversity is the stability of the community. And this is important because um, when we have a disturbance in the world, it has an effect on species, and we want to look at how quickly life gets back to normal, right? How stable is this community? And so we look at diversity, stability, and we see that disturbances in species-rich communities. So when there's lots of different species, they're cushioned. Because there's so many species interacting, the disturbance won't be as dramatic as if it was a less diverse community. Year-to-year -year variation will be lower the greater the species richness. And we can see that with the coefficient of variation in the plant community and the average plant species richness. So the next thing we want to look at is succession and community change. So succession is gradual and continuous change in the composition and community structure of species over time. This is only after a disturbance. So maybe a volcano explodes or there's an earthquake big enough to open a fault. And this primary succession is a newly exposed site. So it would have previously been occupied by soil and vegetation if it was secondary. But in primary, it's newly exposed. So there was not anything there for soil and vegetation before this event disturbance. After the disturbance, it takes a long time, hundreds of years, to gradually start to have species come and diverge on this new land. In secondary succession, we see that it used to be soil and vegetation, and maybe a tornado went through, or they had a fire or flood or what have you. The site had already had life, so we're not starting over at square one. We already have soil organisms. We already have things that are there to continue and perpetuate life and help push it along much faster. So the theory of succession has us look at the climax community. So the climax community is like the end point and the disturbance might push the community back to an earlier stage of its development, but it still will proceed toward the climactic event or the point at which the community is at its height. Each colonizing species makes the environment a little different, and that matters in facilitation. What happens is that the colonizing species changes the environment so much so that it becomes more suitable for the next species. This will continue until such time that a competitively dominant species colonizes. So this could happen early or late, and depending on when that happens, depends on the richness of the species we'll see. So one example is in Alaska. Glacier Bay was used as a site for facilitation, so we could study mechanisms of secession. And over the past 200 years, the glaciers have retreated about 100 kilometers. The secession follows a very distinctive pattern of vegetation. We start with cyanobacteria and then get moss and lichens. Then we start to get some mountain navens, then alder, and then spruce. So we see the stages 
coming and coming over time. And you can see how long it takes, five years, 40 years, 60 years, 200 years, before you start to see these things where they would be, where you would expect them to be um, when the glacier is not there. So there is an alternative hypothesis to facilitation, and that's inhibition. And so what's believed is that um, the species that comes on early stops later species from being able to come in and um, take over the habitat. So whoever gets there first determines what the structure of the community will be. So the primary method of secession in marine intertidal zones, so when it goes, the tide goes out and you get the little sandbars, right? Those are what are being studied in the marine intertidal zones. Early successional species have a great advantage because they can maintain the position of valuable space. So the first thing that comes up are these um, green algae and ulva, so cyanobacteria. But if we take those away, red algae come in right away. If those are there, it takes a really long time for the red algae to come. So if you look at the amount of algae you can see that with the ulvagon, it skyrockets. It comes shooting in and it stays high. But if you leave it, it's very, very low and slow to come in and slow to start marking its ground, taking over space. So a third aspect of looking at this would be that there's like a indifference so it's called tolerance. Any species can start the succession, but the eventual climax community is only reached by a somewhat orderly fashion. So the species that establish and remain don't change the environment enough that either facilitates or inhibits future colonists from coming. So they're not competition intolerant or tolerant. We do see competition intolerant species be very successful in the beginning of secession. We see competition tolerant species appear later toward the climax because they can handle other species in diversity and richness. So when we look at secession, the key distinction between the three models we talked about, facilitation means that a species comes and facilitates its replacement. So one species is there, and then as the next one comes, it takes over for the first. Inhibition, the original species inhibits the next species from coming. Tolerance is unaffected. Species can come and go, but it's unaffected by who's there and when. There are other factors that may influence secession. One of the things that we look at is island biogeography. And so on an island, we have a very unique set of circumstances because um, there's marine. The um, amount of space and land is smaller. There are less things coming in and out of the community, right? And so when we study succession on an island, we look at the number of species and we see that it always tends toward an equilibrium number. So the number of species coming in and going extinct tend to stay somewhat similar. This is called the equilibrium number. So we would think that our rates would be curved because the species arrive at different times and extinctions can accelerate more species arrival because they're competing for that same um, habitat or niche, right? So one of the predictions that island biogeography makes is that it's species area specific and there is an effect on the number of species that will increase as the number of square footage or square kilometers of the island increases. And we do see a positive correlation between the area and the species richness, which makes sense. If there's more area, they can uh, maintain or carry a higher capacity of species. 
Number two would be that the number of species should decrease with increasing distance from the mainland. So when you think about this, the further away from a continent, the less diversity. And what we see is that like forest birds in Polynesia, they'll decrease as they move away from New Guinea. New Guinea is their source pool. It's where their mainland is. So as they move away from there, we have fewer and fewer uh, species living on the islands. The other thing we can predict is that the turnover of species should be considerable. Even though the number might be at equilibrium, we should see lots of species coming and going, but there's actually very little support for this. The next part about this community that we want to look at in the ecosystems are food webs and energy flow. And food webs you've probably talked about before throughout grade school and high school and things like that. A lot of times we look at food chains which are linear. It's a linear depiction of how food is consumed or produced. And one of the things we see through that are how energy moves. So each feeding level in a chain is its own separate trophic level. More complex models have an interconnected series of chains, which is why they call them a web, because it's more like a web than just a straight chain. But if you look at the examples to the right, we can see on the furthest right side, we have phytoplankton. The zooplankton eat the phytoplankton. So the uh, primary producer is an autotroph, the phytoplankton. It makes its own food from sunlight and carbon. The zooplankton eat the phytoplankton, so it is a consumer. And it's an herbivore because phytoplankton is not an animal. The secondary consumer, the fish, is a carnivore because it eats the zooplankton. The tertiary consumer, the pelican, eats the fish. It's a secondary carnivore because it eats a carnivore. If we look on the terrestrial side, we can start with a plant. It's a producer. It's autotrophic. It's the primary producer. The primary consumer is an herbivore, a caterpillar. The secondary consumer is a carnivore. It's a lizard who eats the caterpillar. And the last heterotroph will be the snake. He's a tertiary consumer. He eats the lizard who ate the caterpillar who ate the plant. Sounds like the lady who swallowed the fly, right? So heterotrophs eat other things that make their own energy. Autotrophs make their own energy, right? Okay, so autotrophs harvest light or chemical energy to store in carbon bonds. The primary producers are the base of the food chain. Chemoautotrophs oxidize inorganic compounds to make their own energy. But for the most part, we think of um, plants and cyanobacteria and algae as making up our primary producers. Heterotrophs eat other organisms. So a primary heterotroph or a primary consumer eats primary pre producers, so it's an herbivore. Secondary consumers eat primary consumers, so they are carnivores. The other trophic level that's very important are the decomposers. They eat detrius, and so they're detritrotrophs. They have these plant and animal remains or waste that they decompose, right? These are things like earthworms and fungi, and they're so important in our food chain because that's how we can get carbon back into the environment for the plants to be able to use toward making their own food. So this is a picture of a food web, and we can see it is very vast. Now, some consumers can be more than one thing. When we look at the primary producers, we see stargrass, red oak grass, and acacia trees. These are the primary things that the herbivores are going to consume. So the primary consumers, the grasshopper, will eat the red oak grass. The harvester ants eat the stargrass and the red oak grass. The topi eat the red oak grass. We see termites eating the red oak grass and warthogs as well. 
The impala eat acacia trees. So now we start to look at the primary consumers getting eaten. So a wildebeest is a primary consumer. He can eat a, the red oak grass, but also he can be a secondary consumer and eat the grasshopper. This is what makes a food web a little more complicated than a straight food chain, right? So we can see that sometimes things eat primary consumers, sometimes they eat both primary consumers and primary producers, or sometimes they eat secondary consumers and primary consumers. So depending on where the arrows are pointing shows the relationship between the organisms in the food chain. The chain lengths are short in most food webs, and so most of the time the trophic levels are like two or three long, almost always less than six. The chain length refers to the number of links between the levels. So a lion eats a zebra, one link. The zebra eats grass, second link, right? The grass makes its own energy. So there's three trophic levels, okay? The second law of thermodynamics says that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It is only transferred from one form to another. And so the problem with energy conversion, it's not very efficient. So anytime you transfer energy, some of it gets lost. A lot of times it's lost as heat. And so if you look at this image to the right, this graph, there's an available amount of free energy in a plant. The herbivore eats the plant. And then there's only so much energy that it can take from the plant. The carnivore takes energy from the plant, from the herbivore. And the secondary carnivore eats the primary consumer. And you can see that there's less and less and less energy coming into each organism. Only about 10% of the energy is actually transferred between trophic levels. So the plants, what they make is different than what the consumer gets when he eats it. So the A difference between column two and column one, that A tiny little sliver, that's energy lost as heat. That's for the body to maintain its homeostasis. And then B is the energy lo lost through the trophic level conversion. So we're always losing some kind of energy as we're consuming something else, partly from our metabolism, partly from, you know, just different things. One of the ways you can look at these food webs is through pyramids. And so you can have a pyramid going top to bottom or inverted, bottom to top, does not matter. But when you look at this, you can look at a pyramid of numbers as the number of individuals. So if we have 1.5 million plants, it can sustain 200,000 insects, which can sustain 90,000 predatory insects and one bird, one bird. We can also invert that. So it would be upside down and a single producer like the oak tree could produce many, many, many breakfast, lunch, and dinners for insects or for um, herbivores, right? The second way we can look at these numbers is through a pyramid of biomass. So an oak tree weighs much, much more than all of the herbivores and predators combined on this entire list. Um, but the example we're going to look at is this Florida freshwater ecosystem. So we have 809 plants, 37 insects and snails, 11 fish, and 1.5 tertiary fish that eat the other fish, that eat the insects, that eat the plants, right? So these are based on weight. Five decomposers, fungi or bacteria, are keeping this entire ecosystem in check. And energy. If we look at that same ecosystem is energy pyramid, we can see the amount of energy it takes to sustain the plants. 
how much for the insects and snails, the fish, and the carnivorous fish that eat the secondary consumer fish, and then how much of the decomposing fungi and bacteria we need. These are to sustain the ecosystem, the same amount of people coming and going every year, right? The same number of individuals born and die so that it stays in an equilibrium. Sometimes there's what is known as biomagnification, and this is the tendency of certain chemicals to accumulate or to build up, up the food chain as you move within it. So like something happens and maybe the plants aren't affected, but by the time it gets to a human, it's killing people, which is what happened with dichlorodiphenyl triclophane, DDT. DDT is used in pesticides, or it used to be, and we would see it in the environment. It's very low solubility in water, but really high solubility in fat. Well, the higher heterotrophic levels are going to have high fat. They're eating fat. The plants aren't eating fat. So if it's not very soluble in water, it's not going to affect the plants or even very much of the phytoplankton or things eating the plants, the herbivores. But once we start eating the things that are eating the plants, that's when we start to see these fats break down DDT into pieces that are incredibly dangerous. It interferes with eggshell formation, DDT did, and so it would, um, the organisms that lay eggs, their eggs would dry out and they, their unborn eggs would die. Um, so the U.S. banned DDT in the early 70s, but some countries still do use it in um, fertilizer and pesticides. So biomass, what's biomass production? Well, the gross primary productivity, GPP, is the amount of carbon that is fixed in photosynthesis. This is the amount of biomass made from producers. So it's how much plants, algae, and cyanobacteria are created, right? What is the biomass? R is the energy lost in the plant to cellular respiration. So the net primary productivity, or the NPP, is the GPP minus R. The amount of energy available, the GPP minus R, is the amount of energy available to primary consumers, and it is measured in calories. We use dry weight to measure biomass because if we used weight with water, water fluctuates, and it would be a variable that isn't consistent between organisms and individuals. So we look at the dry weight. The secondary production is the gain in biomass for a heterotroph or a decomposer. So the ecosystem has a certain amount of biomass from the plants and algae and cyanobacteria, and then a certain amount from primary consumers, and then a certain amount from secondary consumers. Terrestrial ecosystems are on land and they have a linear relationship with annual precipitation, right? Also with temperature, evapotranspiration rates can predict how primary production of above ground um, organisms will succeed or not succeed. It's also based on nutrients. So nitrogen and phosphorus are the limiting factors. Now, if we eliminated nitrogen and phosphorus, other gases or other um, elements would become limiting factors. So Liebig came up with a law that says species biomass or abundance is limited by the scarcest factor. And this is why farmers use fertilizers. So that way they can add nitrogen and phosphorus. So they're not limiting factors anymore. It's other things that become the limiting factors. In aquatic ecosystems, we see the primary productivity is limited by light and nutrient availability. So if there's not a lot of light, it's not going to be as productive. And this makes sense, right? So at one meter more than half, at one meter in the water, more than half of the solar radiation is already absorbed just by the water. So this limits the depth at which algae can grow. 
Also, nitrogen and phosphorus are in very low concentration in the water, so the alga blooms result naturally in upwellings or towards the surface or in tidal areas where we see those um, areas where it's uh, high tide and low tide come in, right? So when we look at primary productivity, some of the highest areas we see this are in tropical rainforests. However, tropical oceans, no productivity, like highly unproductive. The greatest marine production is at coral reefs. The temperatures are perfect. The light amount is perfect. So it's um, the continental margins. We also see a ton of nutrient rich area so high productivity and this is where rivers pour out from the land and meet the ocean you can see those as more um, red right red areas the northern oceans are productive due to storms and temperature changes that are constantly happening so in the spring there is a huge increase of phytoplankton it grows really quickly and then a huge amount of um, species that consume phytoplankton increase as well and then all of a sudden the phytoplankton will be gone because they will burn through that resource so that will become a limiting factor on productivity productivity will decrease progressively toward the poles and also throughout the southern ocean so we're going to wrap up this lecture with the energy flow diagram. And so it's important for us to look at how the energy moves. Um, and so we start with sunlight. Plants and algae capture only about 6% of the incidental light coming from the sun. And they use it. Almost all of the energy is used for cellular respiration from the plant. So that 6% from the sunlight is being used for cellular respiration so the plants can make food and create their own energy. The rest is used in the production of plant biomass or plant waste. Some insect herbivores take very little nut plant production to survive and the spiders eat them. Others are the fungi or the um, bacteria that are going to decompose the dying algae or the dying plants. Bacteria can be eaten and taken up. The nematodes and crabs can take it up. And then it gets exported by the tide or washed out to sea. So you can see every species transforms energy, but the biggest source of energy comes from plants, algae, and cyanobacteria. The next major biomass consumer is the bacteria and the fungi, the things that are decomposing. Animals make very little difference in the energy flow cycle.